Welcome to the premiere episode of season 10 of Voices of CX podcast. This week I had Graham Brown on the show and he and I took a good look at the human experience, complete with detours down memory lane. Uh, he's a storyteller by trade and helping leaders tell better stories through data and showcasing great experience is what he does. He's the founder of Pakalan Company, an AI powered data driven B2B podcast agency in Singapore. And he's also a published author on the subject of digital transformation of communication. In our discussion, we delved into the human side of businesses and how companies get so focused on innovating that they lose the human aspect of businesses and end up commoditizing themselves anyways. Beyond that, people are afraid of getting replaced in the business world by increasingly sophisticated AI. But what we think the reality is, is it's more like augmenting humans than replacing them. So this was a fun discussion and a great way to kick off season 10. I hope you enjoy. Ladies and gentlemen, listeners and viewers all over the world, welcome back. We're on season 10 of Voices of CX podcast. It's shocking, I know, but here we are. And today I am joined by Graham Brown. And Graham, I'm going to let him introduce himself in just a second, but I'd like to remind everybody to make sure you subscribe um, so you get notifications if you're following us on YouTube. And uh, let's kick this off. Let's get started with season 10. I'm really excited for this conversation. Graham, take it away. Let us know who you are, what you do, and most importantly, what you're truly passionate about. Thank you, Mary. Well, right now, I'm just very honored to be kicking off this season 10 in this mm. position of privilege. <laughs> Subscribe, everybody. Mary's put a lot yeah, of work do into it. this. That's right. Go and hit that <laughs> subscribe button. Show us some respect. Um, so, yeah, thank you, Mary. I'm a storyteller. That's my trade. I've found out how to make money out of storytelling, which I guess is the been a lifelong quest, really. You know, as a kid, being told off, being scolded for telling mm -hmm. stories. You like storyteller, you. Yeah, like, <laughs> stop telling stories. And it's now one of the most important skills in business. So that's what I do. I help corporates Corporate leaders tell stories, tell better stories through podcasts, also guesting on other people's podcasts. And that's what I do. And a big part of this is, for example, taking data and turning it into a compelling story, which is always a challenge, but an exciting one, as well as showcasing great experience. So that's, I guess, why I'm here. And I believe in, there's a great line I want to share kicking this off from my side is that Ken Blanchard, the one minute manager, said something quite relevant to our conversation today. He said, catch somebody doing something right, which is really a really strong maxim of management. If you think about it, a good leader should catch somebody doing something right. And I think that's where you can really showcase great CX, great experiences, showcasing, it, telling those stories, all those companies doing amazing things, great role models and great examples for people. Yeah. It's a great way to start off. Well, um, for, for those of you who are watching and listening, you're not seeing this live, but it is daytime over here and it is nighttime over there for Graham because we're on opposite sides of the globe here. Amazing. So you've been um, working in the APAC region for quite some time, right? This is something that you, um, you've lived all over the place, but you spent a lot of time in Japan from what I gathered from our pre-call and you're in Singapore right now. Is that right? Correct. Yeah, I want to qualify that all over the place statement. That sounds like I'm a vagabond. Slightly true. A digital nomad. A digital if you nomad. Would. Middle class gypsy. Yeah. Wanderer. Van at life. Uh, yeah, exactly. At heart, at heart, in spirit, I think. I went to, uh, I first moved to Japan in the mid 90s. And um, I graduated with an AI degree. And, and because AI in 1995 was not a thing. Um, there was no jobs in AI in 95. Very different now, of course. I would be commanding huge salaries walking into Facebook and Google. But back then, I could teach AI. That was an option. Or do something else. And so I was suggested a few job options, one of which was to go and teach English in Japan in 95. So I grabbed the opportunity because 95 in Japan, it was still, it was kind of the tail end of what they called the bubble economy. 
you know, Japan just blew up in the 80s. And if you think about all the big success stories in tech of that era, you've got Sony, of course, Sony Walkmans. Mm -hmm. I mean, what a groundbreaking product that was. And then even brands, which, God forbid, if I mention them now, it probably age me, but TDK, <laughs> who made the tapes. If you Cassette remember those tapes. things, the 120-minute yes, tapes. Yes, I those do. Are big, if you grew up in a certain era, you would know TDK. You would know what that meant. But TDK. then they made CDs. Right, yeah. They were, and they and were, the 90s baby that I am, I was all over CDs. Well, it was such a big thing, CDs, weren't they? And that yeah. was kind of like the last big innovation in music, wasn't it, until Spotify mm -hmm. came along, mm -hmm. if you think about it. CDs were massive, you know, that completely transformed the industry and really was the end of it as well because it digitized it in a way. But it, was, it, it was truly such a horrible experience, if I remember correctly, because you couldn't touch the disc. You had to, like, touch yeah. around. And <laughs> that little middle. hole and you just stick your finger in the yeah, hole. Yeah, and you're like, <sighs> and if you got a fingerprint or some grease on it, then it would skip in the track and the CD players were all garbage. I don't well, music's remember always CDs been a being amazing. Crappy experience, wasn't it? <laughs> you, do you remember when, like, if you went in and bought a tape and go back to tapes? I'm not going to let them go. You remember actually bought a tape or, or even a CD? Have you ever tried to open one of those packets? Like Opening the box is atrocious. It's like where, where's the actual thing you're meant to open it with? Uh -huh. And I asked. I mean, I worked quite closely with the record industry in the late '90s when I was working in telecoms and. When I asked one of the execs, like, well, why don't you make these things easy to open? It's because they said they were scared of theft. So you walk into a record store, they were so scared of people stealing, you know, they would open a CD packet and then steal the CD and just put the box back in the display. That was their major driver. So they were more worried about loss than they were about creating a great experience. And obviously that was their, their loss long term. It was terrible. Right? And you know what? It's terrible again, because if you walk into a store uh, here in the U.S., we have a store called Urban Outfitters mm. that my children love going to. And um, Urban is very Gen Z oriented and they will they have cassette tapes and cassette tape players. They also have vinyl players and they sell vinyls. Nice. The, the, the cassette, when I saw the cassette tapes, I was, my mind was blown. First of all, because I was expect, expecting once again to see maybe Alanis Morissette, Jagged Little Pill. And I was, you know, <laughs> confronted with like Dua Lipa. And it was, it was a bit shocking for me. But it almost became a novelty. It is. It is a novelty item nowadays because the quality is crap. So they're yeah, not yeah. listening to it for the quality. It has but to that's be real. something else. That's authentic yeah. quality. Hey, but I'll tell you what, I bet your kids could never piece together a broken cassette tape where they get, have you ever done that? Where you get some like, yeah. sticky tape and, you know, when it snaps, because sometimes, you know. I bet they wouldn't know what to do if no, the cassette tape ate up, ate up the, the, the spool. Yeah. Uh -huh, and then you had to or like stick their big it. pen in it and like twiddle uh -huh, the thing around to tighten it up. <laughs> These are life skills that you learn out of necessity, right? Now they just kind of swipe, right? Yeah. What do they do? They have to like restart the app because it froze. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is what happens when you create, you know, you, you set out to create effortless experiences right. for people, you know, they, they become soft. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, going back to, before cassettes, albums, right? I know that's kind of enjoyed a bit of a resurgence. The amazing thing about that and really where the music industry lost in that sort of human experience was the beautiful thing about an album is, and I remember from my college days, is you could go around a friend's house and you would first then check out their record collection and they would have it like in a crate or they would have it mm -hmm. in some sort of, you know, like... A milk crate, right? Yeah, yeah, a milk crate. That was even, if you were yeah. like really trendy like that. Uh -huh. EDM music or something and you just <laughs> rifle through this thing and you pull this album out and you had artwork on it and it had lyrics on it and you could open mm -hmm. this gatefold and talk about it with your friend and that was the point of music the experience was all about sharing yeah. it was a shared experience you could sit and read this thing and talk about it together right you know there's photos and there was kind of like memoirs inside the gatefold and that was the beauty of it and then when they took all that to cd like you said, you know, you've got this crappy silver disc and this tiny little plastic cover 
that was all Remember lost. They used to like share. shove it inside that thing, and then if it was too thick because it was a booklet, then you couldn't get it out. Would, it would get all scruffy on the sides because it wouldn't come out. <laughs> oh dear, that's why pirating started. You know, pirating of music yeah. because it was all about sharing. They lost the ability to share. That was the, you know, the shared experience is more important than the product itself. And that's yeah. what created the value of the product. And so when they made it less shareable, young people sought out ways to share it again. And the way they sought that out was through literally file sharing. Yeah. Pure, pure file sharing through Napster and then LimeWire and then eventually yeah. what we got to iTunes, but we couldn't share it with anybody. So now people share their Netflix passwords. And now that's the last thing that they're cracking down on. Do you think that technology is creating a world where there's less sharing and it's so focused on individual experiences that we're lacking that very human element of sharing? Well, technology companies will always find ways to build walls because as you grow, as you become successful, you want to defend your market share, right? You can't become the challenger brand forever when you're a large giant like Facebook or even a Spotify, right? So you're going to have to protect your market. So you'll build walls around your product and the technology. Now, the thing is about young people more than old people is they're very good at circumnavigating walls. Yeah. So what happens is, is they dig under you know, chip their way through or climb over a wall, literally. And we see this in history. If you build a wall around people, it's like building a wall around the ocean. It will find a way through eventually. Yeah. And they'll they'll find ways of connecting with each other. And the reason why people knock down walls is because they want to connect with each other. They want to have that shared experience. And that's very, very powerful. If you look, for example, if you go back to the early mobile industry, you know, there was plenty of walls built there to stop people calling each other, such as the cost. It was like a dollar a minute in the 90s, right? And you actually paid to receive calls. Remember that? Yeah, yeah. Those days, right? And you know the interesting thing? So text messaging was originally included in the GSM uh, mobile phone protocol, which was like, you know, one of the first global protocols. Yeah. The whole sort of network was built on GSM. And the reason why they introduced text messaging and the reason why it was only 160 characters, it was used as testing for engineers. So in the 90s, if you had a GSM phone, occasionally you'd get this text and it would say, test, ignore. <laughs> and you'd think, what was that? And people didn't send texts back then. It was just like this weird thing that came through and you mm, okay, fine. And young people found that actually, oh, I can use this. I can send you this message. And you know what? the mobile operators forgot to charge for text because it was only used by engineers. So they'd built this wall, but young people found a way around and they found a free way of messaging each other. 160 characters, no problem. I'll invent a language to circumnavigate that restriction. And that's the irony is that the telecoms industry didn't have, you know, okay, well, how are we going to make a trillion dollars out of this thing? Well, young people showed them the way. They showed them mobile data. They showed them texting before that, you know, adults weren't doing this at all. So to your point, the tech industries always close in and try and monetize it, but young people then find a way around it. And then that becomes like with mobiles and like with Spotify, it becomes the growth story for the next generation. And what is it about us old people? Are we just tired? Have we just given tired, up? <laughs> jaded? We talk too much about tapes. That's the problem. <laughs> we reminisce. <laughs> I think we're more. The 90s. <laughs> yeah, or the eighties. Eighties were better. <laughs> I wonder. I I would say as you get older, obviously you're less open to innovation and change. But as you're younger, you have less resources. You don't have so much money, so you, you're more likely. Your, your sort of risk profile for trying new things is going to be different. And also the upside, the value in finding tools, social tools to connect with people and have that shared experience is going to be higher. That's why it's always young people that create, especially interestingly, you look where I lived in Japan in the 90s, it was young high school girls 
who really drove that. So if you look at how mobile phones were marketed in the 90s to old men, right? Mm -hmm. And it was the actual, before the mobile phones, the pager. And they had these, what they called the pocket bell, which was just like this clip on page. And you had to be like a doctor mm -hmm. or a gas plumber or, you know, a field guy to have one of these things. But they started giving them to, you know, like executives, you know, salespeople. But they didn't want to use them because, you know, why am I using this thing? I'm, I'm sort of old school, you know, face-to-face -face sales. But what happened was is their daughters found these things and they realized actually you could send messages and all it could, it was just numeric. It was zero to nine. That's all they could send. Because initially it was like, okay, you would send a phone number. It's like phone the office. So you'd send the office mm -hmm. phone number to somebody. But these young girls found actually in Japanese, in phonetic, you can actually, you know, like the word four could mean like she or eight is boo. And you could actually type out like Shibuya, which is like a mm. big sort of meeting place in mm -hmm. Uh, Tokyo, you could actually send a friend this message, which she said Shibuya 9.30, right? So they actually found a way of experimenting with the format because the old people, us, those road warriors, those execs, looked at it and thought, I don't want to try that. I don't want to do it. Yeah. But young people looked at it and thought, wow, there's an opportunity there. That's interesting. I, I have something to throw in there into the pile that boredom is the best fuel for creativity the best mm. and i experiment this with my children which they hate which is whenever they tell me i'm bored and i'm like good be bored <laughs> be bored have absolutely nothing to do because that's when you will create something to do mm. so perhaps us old folk we're constantly so busy that we never yeah. have the time to be bored so we don't create anything new because we're always so hyper stimulated with everything mm. around us that we never have time to let our creative juices flow and come up with something entirely new. And that's you may why be right there. Yeah. youth are so creative. They're so creative because they've got all this time on their hands. Mm. You know? Yeah. A lot of time and not enough money. Yep. <laughs> it's the other way around for us. You're obviously right. I mean, to be bored when you're on the wrong age, wrong side of 40 is like a luxury. Yeah. I'd like to be yeah. bored right now, but I don't have time to be bored, but I'd just like to sit and read a book, you know, just be bored, just stare at the wall for an hour. That would be a luxury. I know. It's, it's it, when we consider it a luxury, it's what we do in our time off. Mm. Right? Mm. And that's, I mean, it, it seems to our listeners and viewers, it seems like we're just talking about nonsense here, but in truth, this all kind of makes sense. Because Graham yeah. and I have spoken a lot about human experience and about and what it means to, to extend that kind of value. It's not only for customers. It's not only for employees. It's, it's not only for, you know, quote unquote, stakeholders. It's everyone. Everyone is mm. a customer. Everyone is a person, right? So what do people consider to be value? Mm. And if something is valuable, then we'll, we'll spend our time, our effort, our resources in attaining something that is value. And most companies out there, what they're looking for is to create value for customers. Mm. If they create something that the market perceives as valuable, it then becomes worth it to exchange it for money. It then becomes worth it to um, go from one cell phone plan to the next, from one mobile carrier to the next, from one technology to the next nowadays from one streaming platform to the next. If you're able to create more value than someone else, that's how you gain more market share. That's how you conquer new customers. Right. And, and all of this stuff is yes, very much led by innovation nowadays and how the innovation that companies are presenting is keeping up with the ever changing expectations that the market has. And so much of that truly is fueled by our youth. You know, and it's it changes so quickly. It's up to the market to find out what we want next, sometimes before we even know it, you know. And how is it that in your time as a storyteller, you have used stories to get that value 
across because so much of that is done through storytelling. Mm. It's not through showing a piece of tech. It's about telling people what the value is in that. And this has been going for millennia, perhaps, mm. where the value of something to be exchanged is, is truly brought across through a story. So let's mm. get into that a little bit. Yeah, it's a really good point when you talk about value, Mary, that without story, there is no value. We don't understand it. We don't understand the information you're trying to give us. It's just data. And what a story does is just package value or data and help us understand where it fits in our world. In the same way, you could put a lot of dots on a piece of paper and it makes no sense. But if I told you it was a map and you are here, then you would see the world through it. And that's how a story works in many different ways. And in, if we look at the world of tech, for example, that increasingly the differences between technology A and technology B are minimal. There used to be a time when one company had CDs and the other was in the cloud. That was a big sales point, but now they're all cloud. Those differences are gone. And even the people who are writing the code for these companies are the same. They outsourced. Okay. They went to the same the, schools. <laughs> same schools and probably an Indian um, developing development or a Vietnamese development team. You know, maybe they got a project or a product manager in the US. But increasingly, if you look under the hood of these companies, they're all the same. A, a great example of this is you look at food delivery, which is very much what people say is delivered or on the back of maybe machine learning algorithms. You know, I can get this you know, fried chicken to this house through this driver in the optimum time. It's just sort of like Uber or any kind mm -hmm. of ride sharing platform. The interesting thing, if you look here in Asia, is, is it anywhere in the world, you can go to a food court or wherever they pick up the food from and you will see a delivery bike there. And this guy will have on the right hand side of his bike, a green box for Uber food. And the other side will have a, a pink box for a food panda, right? It's the same delivery driver picking up the same food from the same food suppliers, delivering to the same customers. And the only difference is the color of the and the brand, right? And that's all it is. And it's kind of like in the old days, one of a journalist asked Freddie Mercury from Queen before he was kind of outed for his outrageous lifestyle. They said, uh, Freddie, are, are the rumors true? And he turned to the journalist and said, Darling, I'm doing everything with everybody. And we're in that world. We have this Freddie Mercury syndrome scenario where everybody's doing everything with everybody. And there's nothing differentiating technology A from technology B. The only thing left and the only thing really worth competing for in the experience, level of experience is the stories and the people. That's all that differentiates A and B is the experience you have of the people of that company, the stories that they tell you know, in public, their leaders, their you know, public spokespeople, their partners, the frontline staff, the stories that they tell. And stories doesn't necessarily mean, you know, writing a book. It could just mean the words that they use to talk about what they do. That's the only differentiating point. So it's at that level of human experience. That's the only differentiator left because everything else underneath is easy to swap out and replace. Hmm. That's really interesting for a couple of reasons. One, this is, for me, this goes to what I refer to as brand identification, right? So it's, it's how that customer in, identifies with the specific message from that brand. Two, that's very intangible and it's difficult for companies to measure. It's especially difficult because the only way to understand things like brand identification is by talking to customers and asking them. And in a world where there's so much data and so much of it is quantitative, um, it becomes about numbers and less about humans. And, and I understand from a corporate standpoint that something scalable um, would, would definitely be the go-to. But so many times we forget to talk to customers and we overlook that human aspect of customers we forget the nuances. And from what you're saying, this is the most important part. 
And in so many cases, it seems to be sidelined because it's difficult to measure hmm. because it's, 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 it doesn't uh, package up in a pretty um, bow to, to present to shareholders in, qu- in quarterly meetings. Um, what do you think about that? Yeah, it always has been. That's the, that's the reality that there always was a, an easier way of avoiding contact with customers. Hmm. You know, I didn't do an MBA to speak to customers. That's been around that attitude for a long time. Hmm. It's easier, for example, if you're a brand simply to outsource your brand, which is what they did. You know, if you were a soda brand in the eighties, you wrote a check to an ad agency and they told you what your brand was and they effectively created that brand for you. They even thought of themselves as the custodians of the brand, interestingly. Mm. And the brand was simply writing checks. And if you got them a TVC of 30 seconds on mainstream media, you weren't going to get fired for doing that because nobody got fired for booking an ad campaign on TV. That was the reality. So that's always been around, that attitude. And it took brands to do it differently that had empathy and that cared about that human experience going way back you know we're not just talking in the world of data but before that to really build and say we're going to do this differently a great example of that is red bull for example who could have easily gone down the route of competing in the soda business Mm. as another soda with coke or pepsi uh, but it knew who its customer was and who they weren't, importantly. And Red Bull decided, we're not going to compete as another soda. We're going to create our own category and mm. we're going to own it. We're going to be, even if we're the only ones in this category, we're going to lead it. And that's the power of what marketers call the strategic narrative. The category narrative is that effectively you're choosing your own map for yeah. the world and you're owning it saying, this is how I see the world. But that requires that ability to go to the front line, to exist in the field, to talk to customers, to walk in their shoes, empathize, feel, lean into their pain. And whether it's the world of data or pre-data, you know, it requires people who are willing to be vulnerable, who seek out the human experience and enjoy that kind of connection. And yeah that really creates a powerful brand because experience is the brand for so many customers today. Yeah. I'm a strong believer in that. In fact, Uh, but going, dipping our toes ever so slightly into technology, if you would. And, Mm. and, you know, you studied AI, right? Mm. So what does technology, what is the place of technology in everything that you're saying? How does it fit into storytelling? How does it fit into the picture? Mm. Very much the two bedfellows, I believe, AI and storytelling, data and the human experience, if you like, that it's, to put it into, to tell it through story, it's like a balloon, you know, like a hot air balloon. It flies naturally. It lifts naturally, gracefully doesn't require you like pulling on the burner really hard to make this thing go up. It just will rise. But that's the problem. A lot of people go at customer experience or human experience and they're pulling on the burner like, got to, got to get this better, got to do this harder, right? But that's not the way to do it. The way to do it is to throw out the sandbags. That's what keeps the balloon from rising is the sandbags that you've got on board. And those sandbags is work. It's the work that gets in the way of flow. It's the walls that get in the way of the human experience that people go outside and they look for customers. But what they should be doing is breaking down the walls that prevent customers connecting with them. And that's where data and AI can really help because they can automate a lot of that. They can automate, take away the heavy lifting and What the problem is right now, Mary, is that a lot of companies are just doing the automation. Mm. They're just doing the heavy lifting, but not thinking, what are we doing with this? Where where are we going with this thing? We're just putting in algorithms, but, you know, we're putting in a chatbot or an algorithm to connect the driver and the the food stand. But where is it going? And it's like the old apocryphal tale, Winston Churchill, who was asked during the war, 
you know, to cut funding in the arts because they didn't have enough money to fight. They want to cut arts and education. And he turns around and he says, then what are we fighting for? And it's the same that we should ask about AI and data and automation, that what are we automating for? We can't just do this with no understanding of how that's going to free up time or create this very human experience that happens naturally once you take away the work, once you take away the walls and allow people to connect at the very human level. That's what we've got to strive for. That's happening. There's some great examples of companies who do that in the service industry, who are using data and AI to really give people superpowers or be more human effectively. Can you give us some examples of that? Yeah. The, I mean, it's not the obvious ones. We were chatting about this before. It's like there's two examples in the service industry, which I think really highlight how to do it well and how to do it badly. The bad example is Henna Hotel in Japan. Now, Henna actually means weird in Japanese. It's the weird hotel, a bit of a novelty hotel. You go into the hotel and you're met by robots, you know, one of those cute sort of robots with a big head and it looks pretty useless, but it will guide you to your room. And people thought it was really fun. They blogged about it. It was all over you know, Instagram and TikTok and that. Now, after some time being led to the room, you know, you feel a little bit cold. The experience is pretty negative of Henner Road Hotel. So once all the sort of first wave of customers have come in and experienced the novelty factor, the other customers get quite bored with it. And interestingly, on Henner Hotel, the way they 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 set AI into motion is they, they use robots in the front and human beings in the laundry rooms at the back, which is kind of interesting, that sort of <laughs> visual of what's really going on. That's what people are quite scared about, I think, about when they talk about it's very Skynet. <laughs> it is. It's like, wait a minute, where are we going with this? I'm in the back with, in, with the dryers. That's not what it's meant to be. By contrast, Heidi Lau Hot Pot, which is owned by the richest restauranteur in the world, all over Asia, hot pot restaurant. You know, it's like a shared... You know, it's your shared sort of experience where you sit around a table, that the chef comes out and does all the kind of entertainment stuff like that. What they did is they flipped the kitchen model on its head. So the kitchen traditionally is the seat of power in food and uh, beverage industry. That the kitchen, the big chef, they automated that. So they automated the kitchens, made them smaller, and then shifted all the power to the front line to the waiters. So the waiters became these, this ambassador of human experience. So they went out. If you went to Heidela Hot Pot, the waiters would know, for example, what combination of sauce that you prefer because it's all stored in data that you've used before. There's something like 180,000 combinations. They knew if it was your birthday. Um, they knew what you liked to drink. And then, you know, they would do, because they freed up time, it enabled them to do more human um, experiences effectively they would do one of the examples like there's like a noodle dance or something like that but there's sort of entertainment people liked it and it was fun it was great for birthdays and so on but it's interesting the model is very different they're both using data both using ai but they're using it in a very different way like hen the hotel used data and ai to replace humans they replace them with proxies for humans they're robots and put humans in the back. Whereas Heidi Lau did it the other way around. He said, right, this is where we connect you and me at the front line. Let's double down on that because that's what it's all about. Everything else can be copied and replicated. Let's use data to empower that, to augment that, such that that way that's only focused on connecting with you and creating an amazing experience. And that really has a completely different outcome. It's the same technology, but employed with a different mindset. One is replacing humans and one is augmenting humans. And I think that kind of is a good little vignette of how in any industry you can use data to make the experience better. Yeah, absolutely. But it's what I, the beauty of it is that you're freeing up humans so that they can be more human. Hmm. You're taking out that idea that we have kind of painted in our minds of some 
old footage of the beginning of the industrial era with just hundreds of people in like black and white footage slaving away in a factory uh, on, on a manufacturing line. You taking that away and you're mm. allowing people to go back to to feeling, to experiencing, to living, to interacting, right? Mm. And this this is a future that's less scary, I think, when we think about it. If we're automating the part of work that consumes our soul and it allows us to step back out and experience life, you know, there's so much to be said right now at this moment, you know, we're recording this conversation in September, 2022, Mm. One of the main conversations is, is the up and coming generations looking to have more work life balance and step away from that whole idea of living to work and going back to working to live. And it has a lot to do with that. Mm. You know, we were so conditioned in so many ways to step into our offices sometimes when it's still dark before the sun even comes up. And by the time we step outside, the sun is already gone and the whole entire day has passed us and we haven't lived. You know, I am a, I'm a huge proponent of promoting the work experience of, mm. of being human at work, of encouraging others as well as ourselves to show up as people and not as machines and it all kind of goes along with that same idea. If we're using technology properly, if we're using data properly, then we get to be so much more human and we get to be vulnerable and we get to be emotional and we get to cultivate these elements that are so very human. And sometimes we set aside because of the necessity that we have to produce. Right? Hmm. Yeah. We should... I mean, sort of looking forward, Mary, we should, I mean, for the listeners as well, we should always be mindful of this transfer of value, this shift that happens over time. And like you mentioned, is going back to that, the original industrial revolutions, you talk about those, those images of what appears to be sort of slave work. Yeah. The reality is that, and really that's kind of evolved and there is a lot of that still around, but they're not maybe doing it in factories, but they may be doing it with spreadsheets somewhere in an office, right? That's reality. And I, I think, you know, let's not forget, for example, the word computer. That used to be a human being. A computer used to be a job. That somebody could be a computer, you know, and that's obviously changed over time. And what was once a very respectable civil service type job has now become something which is just commonplace and you know, done for less than a cent, if you think about the computational power that we have now. So that, that's the change, that's the transfer of value. In the same way, for example, if you go back to the American Civil War, you know, if you look at the mid-19th century, for example, the, the value of a horse back then is pretty much the same value as a horse now. You can buy it for the same price with, you know, inflation. Mm -hmm. It's the same, right? But what's changed is that if you had a horse in that era, you wouldn't have used it for what you use it for now. Back then, horses were, you know, they were tools. They were wor working on farms or transport mostly for people. Or, you know, before people had mass transport, they used horses. They used it to drag timber around, right? That's, that's the reality. Today, people don't really use it for that, but they use a horse for leisure. But the price is still the same. So the point is, is that things retain value, but they shift from one to the other. And it's the same with technology, and it's the same with skills as well, which is the real problem, because people have a bunch of skills, like, oh, I was a computer once, <laughs> that can now get replaced. And the interesting thing here is that you talk about people showing up for work, you know, showing up and leaning in. What does that mean? Now, if you're an accountant or a lawyer that's had many years of expensive training, what does it mean to show up and lean in and create a human experience? Because these are the guys that are going to get replaced first. It's not going to be that guy that works at 7-Eleven, the immigrant. Because if he loses his job to a machine, 
I tell you what, Monday morning, he's found another one. Mm -hmm. You can't say the same of a lawyer or somebody who has many years of experience, a doctor, for example, you know, who's going to get replaced extremely by... extremely expensive, right? Yeah. Um, They're the ones that are going to go when you, you look at, I mean, what does a doctor do? They spend most of the time looking at scans and diagnosing scans. Computer can do it faster and cheaper, I'm afraid. That's the reality. That's where we're heading with this. It's going to be that top level of elite workers who are going to get replaced in this shift, right? And that's, those are the people that have to understand, I need to upskill. You know, I'm a doctor, I'm a lawyer, I'm an accountant, I'm the elite of society. It's me, not the low-skilled manual workers, it's me that needs to learn human experience. Because I tell you what, a machine can do everything a doctor can do and better and cheaper and it doesn't rest. <laughs> You know, it's there just going through thousands, millions of scans and much more accurately. But what a machine can't do is it can't sit by your bedside and hold your hand and say, are you okay? That's impossible for a machine because it doesn't do it from a position of empathy. It's never been through that. It's never experienced loss. It's never experienced vulnerability or weakness like us humans. That's the human experience. That's what we have to double down on. And those are the skills that we need to train leaders in to really create that human experience, not just for their companies and their organizations, but for them and their work. That's the most important thing. If they want to retain their value and be relevant and be useful to society beyond the era of the machine, they're going to have to learn those skills. But I don't think everybody's ready for it. And we've seen in history as well, the interesting, I'll just leave you with the thought when you're talking about that industrial revolution, it was the, you know, if you think about the original industrial revolution, that the first people to be sucked into the machine, if you like, and dehumanized, were not the low skilled people. The, probably one of the, the highest paid jobs you could have had as a non landed gentry in that era was an artisan, a weaver, the weavers, you know, you could work three or four days a week, you could take the rest off, you had your own land. You know, for somebody who wasn't born into royalty, it was a very, very good profession. You got it handed down father to son, you could look after all your generations. That, that sounds like a doctor to me. That sounds like a lawyer to me. That sounds like an accountant today to me, to be a weaver back then in the 18th century. But as soon as they brought out the mechanical loom, the, you know, the thing that created all these patterns and created textiles. It was the weavers that got decimated, but they never saw it coming. And it was the weavers that went and smashed up the machines. So I see we have this in the next 20 years, almost like this flipping of the value pyramid. It's going to be those people that can hold the hands and say, are you okay? And empathize with people would be the most valuable in society. And those who effectively are just looking at patterns all day, you know, looking at spreadsheets, looking at scans, looking at case law, you know, you, you got it coming. You're the next generation of weavers. Yeah. That's a, a, a pretty um, harsh awakening call for all the Finn bros out there. who just <laughs> spend the day looking at tickers. Your days are numbered. Anyway, but if, if we were to take that and, and, and apply it to companies and customers and What's value to customers? It's, it's the same thing, right? Hmm. What, what customers perceive value in, what companies are going to be able to sell, it, the automation, the automated, the commoditized. Yeah, I mean, you'll have, it'll be one in a million. An experience that's truly human, hmm. an experience that connects, that will yeah. be more valuable. It'll we see it valuable. now, don't we, with some... I mean, really, that human experience is being led by the leaders, right? So those are the ones yeah. that are, are building their personal brands, they're out there being vulnerable and leading, leaning into the problem, right, of the customers. Those are the ones that lead. And I think they yeah. are great examples. You know, we all heard about, I mean, Starbucks, I think, is a great example in that um, Howard Schultz is one of the first really to kind of 
I know Starbucks is it's an easy target, but as far as fast food brands go, it's done pretty well. You know, considering that yeah. it doesn't really have a lot of difference from McDonald's in terms of the product. Let's face it, it's not that healthy for you compared to, <laughs> you know, let's say Whole Food Markets or something like that. But McDonald's, Starbucks, Starbucks has a great brand by contrast, and a lot of it's to do with the leadership and the experience they create. And a part of that is the leaders like Howard Schultz stepping up and being vulnerable and he's done it pretty well. I'm not always, but I remember some years ago, I know this must've been before black life, black lives matters. He stood up and said, let's talk about race. And he just got pilloried. He got killed in public as a result of it. But that's the right thing to do. You need people who stand up and take a risk to create that yeah. human experience, right? You, you can't just say, oh, we're going to do what the next guy's doing, right? But cheaper or faster. Yeah. You need people like that who are willing to be vulnerable and take risks. That's where it starts. That's what creates the experience. Willing it's to not be, the logo. Willing to be human, right? Willing to be wrong. Yeah. yeah, that's a big part of it, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, that's actually beautiful. Well, um, I mean, I think that this ties back to your storytelling. And you have a podcast that talks mm. about exactly this, right? Yeah. I mean, podcasts are a great way to tell stories, showcase stories. Mm -hmm. My podcast, Be More Human, is really a journey into understanding what it is to be human, especially in the era of the machine. You know, what do we as a species, what do we as brands, what do we as company leaders really have to think about? Because we can't take it for given. It's not going to be given that we are going to have jobs like this in 20, 30 years time. Yeah. You know, what do we need to do? And that being wrong, being vulnerable is really what it's about. It's the, creating that art, you know, creating that connection that really defines us as human beings. And, you know, we have to think of it from the heart. We have to, you know, not necessarily try and build the walls or make things stronger, but do the opposite, break things down. It's counterintuitive, especially if you're from the corporate world, but there's some great examples out there and I'll do my bit to showcase them. Yeah, that's awesome. So I invite all of you to listen to Graham's podcast, Be More Human. Thank you so much for coming on. This was a pretty deep conversation about yeah. humankind, it. let's say. It's a great way to start off season 10. And um, how can people find you and contact you and reach you if they want to discuss this topic more, if they want to just connect and stay on top of what you're doing? Yeah, go to my, my website is the starting point. So grahamdbrown.com is always a good start. You've got to put the D in there because <laughs> without the D, it's a wallpaper website. So you might go there and think, wait a minute, I don't see any podcast here. It's like an interior design website. But Graham D. Brown. Yeah. So go and check out that. It's got my podcast work as well as my podcast on it. That's a good starting point. That's wonderful. And subscribe, well, by the way. So subscribe to not subscribe. only my podcast, but this one. Come on, subscribe you humans out there. <laughs> Mary's podcast. She asked you, so I'm going to remind you, you've got to subscribe because it's good. <laughs> thank you so much, Graham, for being with us today. And thank you to all of our listeners and, 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 and viewers for sticking with us for 10 seasons. And we're still here and we're still putting out more. And we'll see you all next week. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure having you on today. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Voices of CX podcast. This podcast is sponsored by Worthix. Discover your worth with the customer value alignment platform. We're helping the world's biggest brands align with their true customer value. Learn more at worthix.com. Episodes are produced and edited by myself, Steve Barry, and Ashley Alufahai. See you on the next episode.